and welcome to the Strong Life Podcast. I'm your host and your boy, Zach Evanesh, the founder of the Underground Strength Gym. And each and every Strong Life Podcast, we're going to talk to you guys about what it really takes to develop a strong body, a strong mind, and to live a strong life. Up in these neck of the woods, we ain't got time to be weak. We've only got time to kick ass and take names in life. Here we go in three, two, one, action. Three, two, one. Everybody, welcome to the Strong Life Podcast. It's been a long time since I've actually had a guest on the show. Very hectic schedule and uh, hectic lifestyle lately. But I wanted to bring somebody back that inspires me many times. And uh, I've uh, met him through Instagram which is funny because the the technology era, this is really the power of how we can uh, connect and learn with people. And uh, my friend Andy McKenzie's on the other side. It's a little bit <clears throat> blurry for those of you that are watching the uh, video, but we are going to link up all of Andy's uh, his website and his social media platforms. We connected through Instagram, and he is just a physical culture boss. I mean, he's ripped. He's ripped. He's always eating amazing food, lots of energy, very inspiring. And uh, you've got a small gym. You said you're a little bit uh, outside of London. And uh, let's give everybody a little bit idea of uh, where you're from and kind of what a typical day looks like for you and what you have going on. Uh, um, first off, Zach, um, thank, thanks very much for uh, asking me on the uh, the podcast i mean i've listened to the other ones and uh, <laughs> thank it's, you but it's pretty weird actually sort of like looking and chatting uh, as well nice. um my my background i um i was born in scotland and uh, and then from a, a very early age i um i joined the army and um i was in the military for 16 years um and it gave me sort of a fantastic grounding and colorful life and and showed me more uh, things that you uh, you can never get in a book um, or, or read about or anything like that. Um, and then from there, I just uh, I always wanted to do more. So uh, I left the army um, to work in professional rugby um, as a coach, sorry, as a strength coach. And then from there, um, I wanted to own my uh, own gym. The opportunity came up, so um, I moved. Um, I moved um, from where I was living uh, in a place called Wales, which probably means nothing in sort of like uh, in terms of geography to you guys over in America. But uh, yeah, I moved there and, and I've got my own little gym um, called The Training Lab, which is in uh, East Grinstead, which is um, 40 minutes away from London. Awesome. And uh, you I don't know if you listened to it, but a good friend of mine, Alan Cosgrove, um, was from an area of Wales. I don't know the exact, or an area of Scotland. I don't know the exact area, but he's, when he describes it, he describes it as very, um, it's like pretty bad, he said, the area. <laughs> When, <clears throat> oh yeah, I mean um, it is, it's pretty weird because like there is always a check and balance on how you how you talk because if I if I spoke like I was back in Glasgow, then this podcast would be null and void. We would just would not communicate like, <laughs> properly at all. So um, and it's it's weird when I go into coaching mode, it seems to come back and sometimes people look at me and think, what the fuck is he saying? I'm like, oh. And uh, you, you're uh, back in the room moment. Uh, yeah, so uh, Scotland's a um, it's different. <clears throat> it's uh, it's an experience that you have to uh, have one day for yourself. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> what's crazy, ironic story is that Alan Cosgrove and I uh, we became friends like this through the internet, and uh, he really took to uh, mentoring me and becoming just a great friend. And then uh, in the town I lived in before. His best friend from Scotland lived down the street. And uh, when we went out one night together, the three of us, the two of them were chatting, and I didn't understand shit. <laughs> I did not know what the hell they were saying to one another. And, um, and what's interesting, and I wonder if it's kind of the, the you know, your uh, upbringing coming from there, but Alan and his friend, they were both on the national taekwondo team, uh, very uh, tough guys. I mean, is that kind of in your nature, the way where you grew up? is? Are you guys kind of born and raised to be uh, tough and physical-minded and, and guys that can kind of handle 
what we see a lot of people unable to handle today, the stress, simple stresses of life. I mean, you, when I see your videos, you're very busy. You're coaching people. You've got this gym. You know, I kind of feel like you're doing a lot like I am. You're very busy, yet you're ripped. You're strong. I mean, you're truly living the code. And uh, where do you think, where does that um, instinct or that discipline come from? <clears throat> I, I, I don't think um, you can say it's just solely from Scotland because it's, it's um, that, um, it's universal. It, um, for me, I think um, the, the grounding always has, um, it's really important, the, I think, the initial things that you actually read. So when I, when I look back, when, when I was a young kid growing up in Scotland, um, one of the first books that I ever read was a book called um, The Journey Towards Excellence, which was a book on martial arts. And it just gave me a different mindset. Um, and, and equally, I'd say growing up in, in Scotland as a young guy was pretty tough. I mean, I lived in what's called uh, a bottom scheme, which is a really poor rundown um, housing estate. Um, which when you when you meet people at school and stuff like that, they mm. automatically assume you're going to be a dumbass with no real prospects. So for me, I'm like that in me. Do you know what I mean? You can't really sort of like pigeon me whole, uh, sorry, pigeonhole me into sort of like a box and say that's all you're um, that's all you're going to do with your life. So um, I, I suppose for me, I use that as a driver. But I think um, <laughs> the the things that you read um, are pretty um, crucial to your initial development, then that's why it's important to, to the, the book that you wrote, for example. I mean, if somebody picked it up and he'd never trained before, then for me, that's the perfect grounding, the perfect opportunity for someone to grow and develop from. Awesome. And how old were you when you uh, went to the military? Uh, Zach, I was, um, I was 16 years old uh, at the time, so very, very young. Which is, is crazy. I mean, um, there was, there was at the time it's called Junior Leaders um, Regiment Royal Artillery. So you you spend a year being um, developed in, in sort of like trying to be the next leader of uh, in the British military. Um, when I look back at that time, it it literally it was amazing in terms of, of what it done. It was sort of like con continue um, putting you in um, situations you just think. Fuck! I don't know what I'm doing here, but because your um, it is gradual, you end up building uh, this attitude of all right. I'll just this is all I have to do to get it done and get, and get moving. So, um, so that that was like a year of complete uh, it, at times a mind fuck thinking I don't know how I'm gonna sort of like get on with this. But all of a sudden something clicked and everything just became normal. Do you know what I mean what was hard at the very very start? It became normal. Then when it became normal, it became more enjoyable. And then from there, you actually saw a little bit more of a challenge then because you just wanted to see how far you could push it. And for me, it was like a really interesting time. And <clears throat> it's a time when I look back and I think, what did I actually get out of that? And how can I use um, what I learned back then into like my daily life now? Because sometimes we forget um, things that where we come from. So, yeah, I mean, so, like, really, really young in, in terms of um, when most people look at it, they're a bit shocked because it's a while it's the military, but it was just a training environment for a year, and it was a fantastic process. You take, do you take that, um, you know, when I look at how I train athletes, we kind of have this introduction time, and for them, I think it might be a mind fuck. They're like, holy shit, the first two weeks, like a kick in the balls, and then they seem to turn the corner during week three and four. Then after the four weeks, their body is um, responding in a powerful way versus, as is their mind, versus feeling like it's dragging them down. How do you work with somebody new coming to your gym, to your training lab? I see amazing things going on in there, stuff that I feel like I haven't seen for a long time, and I think that's what connected me to you because you're true physical culture. Sometimes I see bodybuilding work, sometimes powerlifting, many times bodybuilding and unique uh, mobility stuff that you're doing. What is kind of, you know, if you could break down the process of how somebody new when they come to you, how do you um, build them up? 
Um, all right, then. The, the first thing for me is, is going back to what we just spoke about, is creating an environment that, <clears throat> that seems normal. Because if it's the first thing that they've walked into a gym, then that is, their, that is their world, that is their map of what a gym looks like. So for me, that's really important. Um, and then the, if, if, the, if they've already been a, a, from a culture where it's been just one way, then you've got to show them there is no one way. that you've, the, the gym is sort of like body weight, as you said, there's kettlebell there, there's powerlifting racks. So it just becomes normal. What I tend to do is literally make people feel that they can do anything. So um, I don't give them things that I know they won't be able to achieve, but I just I challenge, I challenge them enough. One of the things that I think uh, as a coach you have to be mindful of is where you're at is completely different to where your athlete or your young client is at at the moment. Um, so one of the things that I'm really sort of hot on is this, this belief that you can do anything, that everything, that this gym environment is normal. Because um, if you look at it, most people are, um, they might have had a poor upbringing, they might have had people that um, always um, would sort of like look down on them, like tell them they can't really do things, they might have a boss that just gives them a hard time, they might have like a wife or a husband that they just don't really love. All these little facets of people telling them they can't do something or they're no good. And then when they come into my environment, then even that one little thing and saying, well done, that was fantastic. That, like, but those three words, well done, that, sorry, that's awkward, that was fantastic. That could just be the, the little pivotal thing that actually makes them go, fuck, no one's ever told me that before. And, and that's what I'm about. That's how you, for me then, that's normal behavior. That's how you should speak to someone. You should be positive and encourage them. So when they walk in, they can go, yeah, do you know what? I can do that. And, and for me, that's a, a gradual process then. So I make them feel comfortable. And then the, uh, when you're comfortable and then you, you, uh, you allow yourself to stretch when you're ready, then you can do things that other people just think, how does he do that? So pretty long-winded version there. Yeah, but I love it. Um, there's a big mental component. You talk about it a lot when you post your your Instagram. And I think, you know, uh, it's obvious, you know, your uh, hashtag is always like Iron Disciple. And Disciple, it's, um, it's like you're living it. It's on your mind at all times. I, I see the way your lifestyle kind of revolves around it. Talk about you know, your lifestyle, your uh, suit, I don't know how, uh, what your age is, or if you want to share that, but you're extremely fit, and you, I know you're super busy, but you're getting the training in, and that is a question I always get, they're, I work, I have family, and then they feel like they can't get it done, talk to us about, you know, your, what does your day look like, meaning what time do you wake up? How much training of others do you do, and when do you train yourself? Is it regimented or is it flexible? Uh, right then. <clears throat> so first up, um, I am my last years of a uh, thirty something. So next year I'm forty years old, and um, and I've got in my head that at forty years old I am going to be the strongest that I've ever been, um, and I'm going to look the best that I've ever been. And uh, so that is going to happen. And I've got my, I've, I've looked at all my previous uh, lifts and I'm thinking, I'm beating them. I'm setting a benchmark for like 40 and then moving beyond. Um, so th this whole thing of like Iron Disciple is, um, it, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing more than, like, I just believe that if you look after yourself, then you can do amazing things, not only for what you want to do in your own life, but for other people. And I think it's really important then you, um, that you look after yourself. So from a physical perspective, from what you put in your mouth and then what you read and who you spend time with, that sort of like that feeds um, the, the, the brain. So they're really, really important to me because I, I suppose I, I put back to my young, the younger years and being in a poor environment where people were negative and telling me I couldn't do things. And now I think, well, I don't, I don't want to live like that. How, how can I live now? So I can, I can take charge of it. Um, from, uh, from a structure sense, um, I am busy. Um, I normally get up around 6, 6.30, um, and I, I do like a, a specific mobility routine, uh, mainly for my, my neck, shoulders, and spine. 
um, because I, I fractured my spine in four places um, uh, about, about 10 or so years ago. So they're, they're things that I have to do. Otherwise, I don't function <coughs> as well as I do. Um, and then from there, I try to spend an hour on uh, emails um, and then literally answer them back. So people sort of get in contact with me. I really try hard to answer back as best as I can. Um, from there, I then uh, coach clients um, up until 12 o'clock. And for me, that's uh, almost like, it doesn't feel like work. It's really, it's when like everything just flows and I feel like time just goes gone. So it's, it's fantastic. And it, I really enjoy that that uh, time. So um, then the, the the training lab opens from, from 12 till 2. So that's like an, an open gym. And even then, that's that's a time where if if, um, if I've uh, got something on later on in the day, then I might grab like twenty minutes, and it will either be just sort of like straight up squats, or it'll be a, an upper push pull, or the other one is I'll just converse and, and do some um, loot coaching because it's a, it's an open gym, so people are people are there. It's my gym, and, and that's what they're there for. Uh, and then in the afternoon, I spend that on project work. So uh, at the minute, I'm just writing a, a manual, well, finish a manual for my um, bodyweight certification, um, and that takes me up until five o'clock, and then the gym is back up from five. So and that's an open gym, and that's when I have um, like my rugby players and other athletes that I coach as well. So so it's pretty full on from sort of like morning till night time, and then when the gym closes, then that's my training time. That it, it's um, it's. It's generally the time that I just really enjoy and, and, and make shit happen. So, uh, so I'll, I'll grab some stuff at twelve, and if not, then I'll sorry, my social media's going crazy. Um, but yeah, th- then I'll, I'll grab it at the end of the day. So it, it's just got to get done. <clears throat> right. This sounds like a hectic day, like mine. When do you? How do you eat? Um, as far as scheduling, you're very lean, but you're also very busy, and uh, you know, a friend of mine who's a nutritionist nutritionist he be, he told me to really stray away from intermittent fasting you know he felt my metabolism slowed down and I said well I can't eat when I'm coaching people he goes you need to find a way he goes I he goes I'm eating when I'm doing consultations he's like you need to fuel your body he said, can't train hard unless you fuel your body so I started going back and having some post-workout shakes and eating a little more frequently but how do you um, get your food in and stay in such shape like that. The, the nutrition is obviously a big part. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's one I'm, I'm asked all the time. Is first things first, you have to understand that your body is going to function um, in a way that's like, specific to you. <clears throat> and, and it's your job then to find out what works for you. Now, a lot of people always sort of like talk about intermittent fasting and carb backloading and all these other diets like paleo and, and living off supplements and stuff like that. You've, in a sense, you've got to go and try them all and then to find out how you function best. And, I, and I've got to the point now, Zach, where I can eat something instantly know that whether it's going to do good or whether it's going to do bad, especially if it's something new that I haven't had before. Um, I generally eat like a, a really like a, like a huge breakfast, and, and I mix it up. I normally have, um, let's say, for example, omelets with uh, sorry, six eggs, um, prawns, um, some avocado, some like different spices that I really enjoy, and then I, I add in some potatoes in there as well, and and that keeps me going. Mid morning, I'll normally have like a, a protein shake, and then at lunchtime, it's um, like sort of chicken salad, a little bit of rice. So I, I try and get sort of like fats, carbs, and, and uh, protein in every meal that I can. And then I, I normally have uh, time just half an hour just to like cook my own food as well uh, because I really enjoy that. It, it makes me sort of like feel a little bit better when, when I'm sort of like putting it all together. Um, and I always make sure I have an even meal as well. So I had that before the, the coaching starts. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, you've just got to get it done. And it's, for me, it's, do you know what? Find the fucking time. Right. Yes. Find the time, or or you'll make the excuses. How um your gym doesn't look very big. It looks pretty small, kind of like one of my gyms. It's very small, but 
I, I love it. I actually, you know, my other gym is twice the size and I feel a little, I, I like the smaller gyms, even when I'm training at other locations. How big is your space? Oh, man, it is um, 15 meters long in length. Okay. And um, 10 meters in width. Okay, so, so about. It is small. Yeah. So 45 by 30, it's about a 1,200 square foot gym, which is smaller than my other gym. But uh, you've got turf in there. It looks like you've got the small groups going, and it's just, uh, it's awesome. What does, uh, how do you program the training for people? Is there a kind of a general workout, and do you tweak it for individuals as they come through? How do you plan them? Um, you, you have to, I mean, the, the the beauty, I mean, it's nice having space, but like sometimes when you when you when you've got a closed environment and you've got ten people literally ripping the bars off the floor and, and really smashing the gym up, you cannot buy that intensity. And that's why I sometimes I think that I'm blessed because I've got that closed environment, so I genuinely don't mind it. And then the other one is um, I've also got like a large outdoor area, so I've got like um, a two hundred meter car park which saw some of the most disgusting sort of um, barbell sprint sessions known to man. So uh, and I've, I've, I've got both elements, and I, I do like to get outside. I've got, I've got ropes in the trees because um, I, w I want people to get tougher. If it's raining, you're still going to climb up the rope because you just have to grip harder. So it, it, it's a real um, um, positive environment. There's, there's got quite a lot of uh, things going on. In terms of programming, and um, mine is quite specific in terms of I've got like a, a general um, movement prep that everyone does, and then when they get to a certain point in that movement prep, then everybody's got individual um, mobility issues that they've got. So for some it's ankles, for some it's shoulders, some it may be spine, or some it may be a combination of, of um, two or three. But they, they've always, but the, the biggest one is is the one that's causing them the most issues regardless of the session that they're going to go into, is always dealt with until it, it no longer becomes a problem. Because, I mean, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent too much, but sometimes it annoys me when I see people and they're like, they're still talking about a shoulder injury fucking one year later. And I'm like, well, what are you doing about it then? What are you actually doing in your, your movement preparation to actually change <clears throat> and augment the performance of, of your body as a whole? So for me, then, I always, um, so I've got a general one, and then it's very, very specific when it comes to dealing with issues for that client. And that, that's a matter of assessment, and, and then giving them, and then they get, they get on with it. And then from there, um, it's, it's a general split. There's always going to be strength work, and there's always going to be repetition work, um, and there's always going to be some conditioning. So um, the, the gym is small, but the areas are, I've got two platforms for the strength work, got like a, an empty um, uh, sort of an area in the middle for, for body weight and conditioning and, and repetition work and then I've got the I've got the outdoors and I've also got the um, the sled area for um, for the conditioning work as well so when people understand how to move around the gym and they know what they're doing it isn't a problem the um, what the what the problem uh, comes into is that the first time someone comes into the gym and they've trained another gym where it's just that there's no direction then they're, they're they're almost like walking around like a pinball so I, I just set up the environment this is how it works and then people just slide into it and again it brings that comfort factor in um so yeah that, that's how i sort of like program for my uh for clients and athletes yeah i uh i'm a huge believer in the gym must be super organized i tell my coaches every time i say before you leave Every weight goes where it belongs. The racks have the same amount of weights on each side. So it's not, when the gym is disorganized, the people, like you said, it, you could see the internal stress and then it becomes, they like lose their focus. An organized coaching session, organized gym is, is critical. Do you guys do, uh, because you're training adults, do you do uh, weightlifting movements, power cleans, jerks, or are you more power lifting and then like quick lifts with the kettlebells and the dumbbells how do, do you do like the you know weightlifting movements with the adults yeah absolutely um 
again, it, all, it always comes down to what is the goal, <coughs> and, and, and that is it. So if, if the goal is to develop power, and then I then look at well, what's the easiest way to develop power <coughs> without sort of like causing injury or without then having the inability to move the next day. So, I mean, my <coughs> mantra in terms of the gym is always move with a purpose to improve. So if, if I can get away with it at a low level and that improves it, then that's fantastic. But, um, yeah, I mean, the adults still do uh, Olympic lifting moves, um, and they just break down the move until you actually get it. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's just the art of coaching. Yep. Um, I think because if, if you're dealing with an adult who hasn't moved before, then the challenge is greater because you've got, like, a whole load of postural issues that you have to sort out. But in effect, then, that's your job as a coach, then. You, you want to you wanna get them to a position where that they can literally do anything in the gym. So nothing is taboo. Do you know what I mean? If they wanna if they look in the corner and say, Andy, I wanna I wanna know how to do that snatch. The, the beauty is is like when I first devised their program, I've already put in moves that, that I know that are gonna augment the snatch later on down the line. They're already working on movement patterns that if they get the like the hip hinge right, if they work their shoulders in the right way, then when you stick a bar on them and get them to an overhead squat, it's never really going to be that much of a problem. So they can, so as long as they've got all the dysfunctions um, sorted out, then, I mean, there is no right or wrong in the gym then, is there? There's just, um, there's just poor execution of exercise. Right. I think when you build people up the right way, <clears throat> their ability to learn is so easy compared to somebody's new and then they... They've never really moved, and you're trying to teach them a power clean. It's like, it's like uh, you know, sending a young kid to the military. He's not ready, right? A, like a six-year-old to the military. You have to build them up, go through the basic training, train the mind. I I agree with that. With your uh, busy schedule, Andy, with training, basically, you know, your work, your training, uh, morning and evening. What do you do to kind of uh, Brings, uh, I don't want to say balance to the life, but maybe something that allows your mind to calm down because you're a disciplined guy, you have the military background, so you're probably always seeking another challenge. What do you do out of the gym to just kind of calm the mind? Um, I, um, it, it would be very easy and very bullshit to say that that's my life and therefore everything's fantastic about it. You are right, you have to be balanced. I have to get away from that environment, especially when it gets prickly and intense. Um, I'm very fortunate that where I am, there is beautiful countryside that I can go for a walk and like sometimes I'll get up in the morning and I'll go for a walk just to, to clear my mind. Um, on a Wednesday, um, I always have from up until 12, literally to do whatever I want. So for example, um, at the minute, um, I'm looking at doing um, Bikram yoga because I just want to go and be taught by someone else. Right. Um, I also uh, learned to uh, cook, so I'm getting trained by uh, a local Italian chef because I want to learn some Italian as well. So, so they're the little things that I, I get away and challenge myself because I, in a way, the, I, know, I mean, you can look at it and say, well, it's still cooking. But they're, they're things that I really enjoy, and they're, they're moments when I can do and just completely relax and, and not even think about the gym, not think about how to enhance power or like get strong and the, the little things like that. So, so I tend to have that. Uh, the, the Wednesdays are my sacred days in terms of um, just spending free time and doing some something completely different out of the, out, away from the gym environment. <clears throat> I think when I'm away from it, it's almost like a break within itself, and, and for me, that that makes it quite easy. Right. Have you had any uh, challenges with your business, growing the business, starting the business? Kind of lessons you'd want to share. A lot of coaches listen, um, and they love to hear. You know, not not always. Um, it's not always as easy, or they people think it's easy. So I'd love to hear. You know, what challenge that you had to overcome. Um, building the gym, growing the gym, or, you know, maybe while it was going good, something happened. What what challenge did you face, and, and uh, how did you overcome it? Um, 
man. It, when, I, when I first opened the lab, it was just <clears throat> like a complete clusterfuck of everything happening at, at one time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I'll give you like a... Um, it, it, like at that time, I was getting divorced, selling my house, uh, moving from Wales to the UK, um, and then at the same time, I, uh, I had a lump in my bollocks. So it's like, um, and I thought, God, how how much sort of like stress can I take just to try and open like one venue? But the nice thing is, though, <clears throat> is I did get through it all, and actually. I suppose like the, uh, the the goal of getting the gym open was actually pretty crucial for me to get through all that. So like a lot of people say that it's um, it's hard work, but sometimes you actually need that to give you a little bit of drive just to keep going because you know there's an end in sight. And um, the, the mistakes that I made was I didn't really know enough about sort of general business and finance and accounts when I first opened up the gym. Just the small things like um, setting up um, like direct debits, the real, real simple things. We think, well, that that's normal. It wasn't. It wasn't normal to me because I come from a pure coaching background where I used to coach at my garage, and then all of a sudden you're coming in, you've got like business rates and water rates, and you're thinking, fuck. <laughs> so like you've got to. Like, I didn't do an honest appraisal of how sort of from a financial point of view it would have uh, like an impact. Um, like uh, on running the business, so for me that that's really key. You've got to get your figures in place and and understand. Can I genuinely do this? But don't use that as a bullshit excuse to stop. Use it as a all right. Then if if that's what it takes, then what do I have to do then to make it happen? That's always got to be the, the uh, switch. And the the other one is so in terms of equipment is I just I, I bought far too much. I got excited thinking. Man, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. But when it came to opening day, I have things that I just didn't need. Do you know what I mean? Things that just gathered dust, and therefore it was a complete waste of money. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like a, a I did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but I suppose it's like, um, I mean, I, I, still, I still look at stuff and think, yeah, I, I want that and train with it. I mean, that's um, uh, the beauty of um, sort of like living with what you do. But uh, yeah, they were, they were the, uh, the big things. And then, I suppose the, the, the last one is uh, marketing is one thing that I didn't really understand because I opened it and thought, yeah, everybody was sort of like flopped to it and, and they didn't. So I, because I didn't have any strategy at the start. Um, but, the, but the honest thing is I don't really beat myself up about it too much because I had a lot going on in my sort of like um, life outside of the gym that I had to deal with. So, I, you know, I look back and I think, hey, so what? I'm, I'm still here because I, I actually persevered. But if I, if I could go back, they're the things that I'd certainly look at. Like the, the initial financials, what actually is genuinely required. Not just what, a lot of people when they look at from a, they, they look at what's coming in, but they never really sort of like stupidly enough look at what actually comes out every month. And they're the uh, things that I got wrong at the start. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, the, the three so <clears throat> you overcame, I mean, that's, uh, was like, you had so much kind of crisis going on in your life and you, uh, opened the gym and, um, their, uh, business owners need mental toughness. Coaches have to be mentally tough. There's times where you have to wake up early or, you know, preparing your food, not eating like a normal person does, meaning, you know, you you don't get to maybe sit down at the dinner table all the time. So there's things that need to be kept in check to keep you going because you represent your own work. So yeah. it's uh, it's a, a lot of mental toughness is, uh, I feel, you know, you had that. You came from a uh, tough area, then you were in the military. I think you were pretty high level in the military, right? What unit were you in? Uh, I was in a unit called uh, 7th Parachute Regiment War Horse Artillery. <clears throat> so they were like basically the, the airborne like artillery guys that attached to the brigade. Um, and from there, I then moved on to what's known as the Army, Army Physical Training Corps. So they're, um, you're, you're in charge of the development of soldiers within the British Army. So 
like two, uh, I mean, two pretty key positions that um, they gave me quite a lot of experience as well, and uh, and, and what I still hold today as well, which is really important to me. Yeah, it's uh, when you uh, certain things in life I've learned you, you could have done them like 10, 20 years ago, but they were so powerful that you use those lessons today. I, I always say that so much of what I'm able to do is what I learned inside of a shitty wrestling room, you know, shitty hot wrestling room. Um, what I learned as a wrestler taught me how to fight and to be tough during tough times. It's just, uh, you know, I think like you said, those challenges are gifts that maybe we don't see them when they're happening in, during the time, you know, but uh, you, you learn to embrace it. Let's, um, Andy, let's, I would, I always ask people, what's the question you wish I asked you? Do you have a question um, that you wish I asked you or that people asked you more often? That you, I wish people would ask me. Or that you wish I asked you that you feel you wanted to share this piece of information. <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I can't really think of one at the moment. <laughs> it, 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 so I can't really think of one at the moment because, like, as, as for me, like, everything that I do, is is normal. Yeah, I, I don't see anything that I do is sort of special. I mean, I'm lean because I, I, I think it's normal to be that way. So I, I don't know. I suppose maybe that's a question that yes. I want people asking. Why why do you why do you just think that everything that you do is normal? Because it is. I, I get I, I smile and laugh when people say, "Oh, you're an amazing strength coach." And I'm like, "Well, I'm not amazing. I'm a strength coach. That's my job. It's my job to actually." improve the physical performance of someone so if i wasn't doing it then what the fuck am i doing then so you have this you think it's normal to hold yourself to a very high standard yeah but people think like uh that's actually rare and you think that's the way it should be it's normal to be fucking great at what you do everybody should do that reason like of why when, when, I, when I first joined the military we were we um we got taught how to make these little bed blocks and then so it was the first time I ever sort of like was shown that and as was everybody else and then so I just sat around but when we had some free time I got free time like I need to know how to do that a little bit quicker then so it doesn't become a, like a pain in the ass so I then spent time learning how to do it like a lot better while everybody just sat around talking and stuff like that and but for me then I thought I was behaving that was normal because I'm I'm supposed to build that and get that ready. So it's just strange when when you uh, want to see that. When yeah, I, I find that pretty odd when people ask me that. Yeah, I had this conversation with a friend, and he said, um, you know, he goes, you're so passionate about lifting and training. He goes, but uh, you can't expect people to have that same passion. He said, you'll only be let down. He told me his football coach used to literally cry after some practices because he worked so hard not to teach the kids so much about football, but to teach, to use football to teach them about life, to become a better, stronger person today and in the future. So he said, people like you and I, we look at training beyond the building of the muscle, you know, the getting fit. It transcends the gym. We utilize it for life. And uh, I think that's what keeps a great coach in any realm going is that you see it more than what it is. You see it beyond, you know, I guess the surface. And um, I think that's great that you think it's just normal that we should be striving for greatness in everything that we do. And I think, you know, when uh, the people listening – Things like they ask questions about like, how do I, you know, what did you do to start your business? And uh, the first thing I say is, well, I worked extremely hard and I wasn't asking people what is the way to start business. I researched it. You know, I found ways I did the legwork. Whereas if you try to like go right to the answer, 
that's good, but it shows that you're not even trying to do the legwork, kind of with training and nutrition. You know, tell me what I have to eat. Before somebody's saying, this is everything you eat, you know, you need to start training. You need to start trying to figure out how to eat yourself. You have to do the legwork. And I think that's a big part of just living a strong life. And uh, I don't know who said it. It may have been like Napoleon Hill or uh, Earl Nightingale said, why are some people, you know, high level and others are not? He goes, mysteries of the mind. We just don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I, I, I think one of the, the, what I understand now is I am ultimately responsible for what happens. And most people are, are like a blame culture. They, they just tend to say, oh, it was because of this, this, and this, I couldn't do that. And it's like, well, that, that's just a real shitty excuse. Why don't you genuinely stand up and take responsibility and then realize that you, you are in control? The, the, I think sometimes it's the, it's the double-edged sword of, of the, internet, the, the, the internet at the moment. The, there's, on one side, there's far too much information out there that people have just forgot that just the act of doing and getting on with it will actually give you all the information that you need in the right amount along the way it's, it's the actual journey and then the other flip side is like getting to meet like people like yourself and, and, and inspiring others just by the little things that you do but I suppose for me that one of the biggest mes messages that I'd like to get across to people is just take some responsibility look at what I do but don't try and, and sort of like imitate it just try and put your own spin on it because then I get to learn from like you, the, the other person then, because if you're just copying what I do, what do, what do I then get? You know what I mean? I, I just get like a mirrored, watered-down version of myself, whereas I want to look at like what someone else does and, and, and what changes they seem from their own genuine responsibility. So it, the little things like that so that I think is really important. And, and quite often people forget that it's, you know, it's so simple that people don't want to believe it. Hmm. Simple but not easy. Right? Simple yeah. but not easy. Let's, um, Andy, uh, for the people that are listening and that maybe aren't on my blog, because on my blog, uh, I'm going to link up the uh, show notes and all your websites and social media pages. But uh, what is your website? What's for the people listening? So uh, where can they go to find out what you're doing, even from distance? Because you have certifications. Um, you do some traveling. How can they learn from you? Uh, my my main website is um, ironmacfitness.com, uh, and then everything from a social media perspective is the same name, Iron Mac Fitness. So Twitter, um, YouTube, and uh, Instagram. So they they they're pretty easy. Um, and I also have got um, um, Iron Disciple. And um, that's uh, .cool uk, which is just just a facet of um, of uh, training and what I do as well. So they they are the main areas that people can get in contact. Awesome. And for um, we've got a good handful of certified underground strength coaches out by you. So I'm going to really recommend those of you guys listening find a way to Andy's seminars and uh, connect with him to learn from him. That's a great way. And for those of you listening, go to Underground Strength. Dot TV. I'll be uh, putting up show notes. We'll have the video. Obviously, if you're listening, you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher. Please leave us a uh, five-star rating. That would help a lot. And share this with your friends. Share this with people that you think this will inspire them and, and uh, benefit them to learn about living a strong life. And I want to really thank everybody for listening. These interviews uh, and the people listening and taking the time to learn from us it means a lot and it means more to us and especially, you know, Andy and myself, like he said, to take the responsibility and do work with this information. Don't let the information collect dust on your computer. Do the work. Be a worker. Thank you for listening and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon and we're going to close out.